Welcome to the HPC Best Practices webinar series. The series is brought to you by the IDEAS Productivity Project, which is part of the Exascale Computing Project of the United States Department of Energy. I'm Osni Marcus. Uh, I'll start the host, as the webinar as host here, waiting for Eric Palmer. We are from LBL. So the webinar, Secure Software Programming Practice and Development. And the webinar will be presented by Nitin Sukhjan. Nitin is an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science and director of the Center for Cybersecurity and Advanced Computing at Slippery Rock University of Pennsylvania. He has been involved in research and management of various projects related to the security and software challenges in industry and academia. His research addresses the threats to the confidentiality, integrity, and availability in HPC environments. And uh, he uses HPC capabilities to stu study and understand the multifaceted complexities of anomalous behaviors, also to model and simulate complex technical, organizational, and human systems instrumental in providing security and trust. We have issued more than 140 tickets for today's webinar, and all attendees have been muted upon entry. We'll receive questions through the Zoom chat and also Google Doc. I'll paste that address in the chat momentarily. We have asked Nitin to add uh, breaks during his presentation so he can respond to the questions that come in. Uh, uh, one uh, note here is that, uh, um, that I'd like to thank everybody who joined the webinar series, the HPCBP series, webinar series. This is the last webinar in the series under uh, the uh, fu with funding from the DOE uh, Access Skill Computing Project, but we uh, have plans to continue the series, so stay tuned. With that, I uh, will stop my sharing here, it, and then you'll take over. Hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me? You can? Yes. Uh, thank you, Azmi. Thanks, Alti, for the introduction, and thank you all for joining our seminar series. Uh, I am Nitin Sugija. I will be your host for next one hour, and I'm going to discuss a uh, topic on software programming practices and development. Uh, again, that's the, the key, right? Here I added a patch, which normally we add to our systems. We are not worried about security. We are trying to patch security once we have developed the software. Uh, um, so a little about me, which I was going to mention, I'm a student professor and director of the Center for Cyber Security and Advanced Computing at Cyprock University of Pennsylvania. I'm also a Law Inspection National Lab affiliate and a campus champion leadership team a member. I'm also uh, uh, part of the ACM CQC education chapter. My main core uh, area of focus is our high from data analytics with focusing our uh, main focus on cyber resilience. If you are interested in the talk or trying to, you know, work or you know collaborate further please email me at indorsukija at si.edu if you want to see my work uh please google it's all there with that i'm gonna start with a brief outline uh i have exactly 50 minutes and then i'll try to like stop and also have like 10 minutes for q a at the end of the session so i'm gonna talk briefly about why are we discussing about the area why is this important why security is important we all are aware of software development life cycles but what challenges are leading to security in the software development life cycles? We'll discuss about what SDLC means, uh, how do you embed security, what secure software development uh, life cycle means in today's world, then followed by how do we design for security, that's threat modeling techniques, and then we discuss about our static analysis and analysis tools, which we are using for testing softwares. And then lastly, we're going to discuss, uh, we're going to have Q&A. So the first thing with agenda is like, why are we talking about secure software development? Because what's the need? You know, why are we discussing? How is this so important now? So let's discuss some cases which happened, you know, in previous three years, which basically are not the, uh, not one of the cases. There's so many cases happening every day now, but they're major cases. So one of the most sophisticated uh, cyber attack which happened uh, in, in software development life cycle was the solar winds attack in 2020. It was supply chain attack leading to data breaches globally. Here, the threat actors, basically, they try to turn the Orient software into weapon, where they try to gain access to all the major government systems uh, and then thousands of private uh, systems around the world. So they actually infected more than 18,000 customers globally, including all the major US government departments, which is DOE, DOD, and Homeland Security, and all of this we can think of. So we learned this lesson that uh, not enough is there to build a firewall. And we are hoping that's going to protect us. No, it's not going to happen. 
we also need to actively seek out the vulnerabilities in the system. What are the weaknesses which we do not do? Second case we're going to discuss is the dependency confusion attack, which basically is an attack in, from 2021 and was unveiled by a security researcher, Alex Brisbane, Brisbane, who basically talked about the third party dependency. The target is we all are using so many software, we're trying to use third party dependencies for the software. However, if you look at the, uh, the diagram on the right side, if I'm using a private package, which is QWeb, and if I do, my do not know which where the dependency lie, right? It might be some container. However, if somebody's trying to, you know, host a different container which has a malicious the same dependency name, then your you know, your software will basically depend on the malicious dependency. So what they did was they tried to inject malicious code into dependencies uh, which the application uses and which which allowed them to access the application's data. And they tried with this they were they were able to break the system belonging to Microsoft, Apple, Uber, and Tesla. So what we learned is that developers must know about the risk of dependencies confusion and important secure package management because we need we are patching it up, but we're trying to see how the patch and package comes into picture as a whole. Next case I'm going to discuss is the network data breach, which happened in 2022. Uh, I think I'm going to move the screen if you, nobody's visible. To uh, which basically uh, targeted the communities of interest cooperation portal. Now we all are scientists. Some of us are scientists, some of us are not in academia, BP industry. We all are doing, try to use some kind of collab tools to work with each other. Uh, this was the breach which actually tried to, you know, pre, you know, target the communities of interest portal and the, uh, the, the cyber crime group, which was SEEDSEC, which is the political, political motivated groups. Uh, they tried to attack it. They said that they are, this was a response to NATO's human rights violation and because it was fun to leak documents where they leaked 3,000 stolen documents with almost nine gigabytes of sensitive data, which was only intended for NATO countries and partners. Then we learned that, well, we need to promote secure practices. Right? We need to basically tell them what are the vulnerabilities, how to minimize the vulnerabilities, how can we tell people like what vulnerabilities can be exploited and used to inject malware in their codes. We also need to conduct security reviews regularly and also use automated tools to basically securely identify the potential weaknesses in our software. Last case we're going to discuss today is going to be the, the most recent case and the biggest data theft of 2023, which is a move with data breach attack, uh, which happened uh, you know, in this year and was basically done by a ransomware gang called CLOP. Uh, it's a zero-day exploit of progressive software move it transfer enterprise file transfer protocol so we all use ftps right all the transfer protocol to, to exchange our files this data theft basically used uh, by hacker allowed them to inject sql command and access the databases of move it customers and more than 2500 organizations were basically attacked and 62 million people as of 2023 october were uh, affected by this breach so we learned that we need to actually figure out what are our indicators of compromise, which can be exploited and attacked and used by the malicious actors. So I'm not trying to scare anybody off. We're just trying to give a brief outline what is really going on here. So what is the question is what exactly is happening? There are breaches, yes. You know, we are patching, yes. But what exactly is going on here is the cost is increasing in billions now of these cyber attack, right? Uh, now I can discuss the challenges. So we talked about increasing complexity in threat vectors because the challenge is that we have number of unpredictable and highly dynamic factors. The first being the heterogeneity of internet networks, applications, server, and virtual infrastructure. So if you look at your own system, your clusters, your you know your own infrastructure, it's increasing you know exponentially, and you do not even know. It's really difficult to keep control of the application because. You might have multiple network engineers, reliability engineers, but they are working on different open source networks or applications which are trying to, you know, gel together to formulate this one huge infrastructure. But we do not know how these things interact with respect to security. There is a proliferation in the hybrid system models and orchestration of many complex software devices. We're trying to orchestrate all these complex services and containers try to have everything virtualized, posted on cloud. But again, who is managing your security? Are we looking into the patches? Are we trying to install every single soft service? Then we try to converge this big data HPC cloud services. That's again a challenge itself from the development point of view. Security at last is not even considered. Then our reliance 
more and more of applications are basically lying on open source packages. The goal is to have less cost, right? Third party dependency. We have multiple of these. Right now, we speak, we think it's coming from a mirror file, but again, mirror can be a, like I said, they, they will be a duplicate, which will be a malicious file. And then we all are dependent on digital data transfer, right? We all are, any business you do, data is important. Any sizes, they are transferring data on different protocols. Now, risks continue to increase, right? However, the vendors are highly unlikely to know that the software, the apps, or the updates they basically are selling or updating or installing are infected by malicious code when released to public. So that's a biggest challenge we have. Now, why are we having this channel? Because the reason is the security is never a priority. When we develop a software, right? When you design a software, uh, often you know the design priorities you know trump security. We are looking into cost. We're looking into okay. We want to be cost effective, right? And security always comes with additional cost. We need to hire somebody to do that. It also we need convenience in software development. Again, security com comes with inconvenience. It basically means that you know if it. You know, every time I add extra step level of security, that's an inconvenience to a person, right? That's basically we're looking into, you know, for example, if I add a different policy for password, you say, oh, well, it's a difficult policy. You know, you, you, you have to, you're making us change password every three months. That's again, it's inconvenience, but there's, it's required. We talk about faster builds. We need to have more and more version of software build, different iterations, and then as iteration of build, we try to lose the security there. Open architecture, we're trying to build open source architecture. Now, again, open sources are, are good, cost effective, but again, open sources, you know, you, you are supposed to also contribute to them. And if you if you just you can't just keep taking it, you need to make sure it's open architecture with all the security inbuilt from your aspect. Then backwards compatibility, right? We are looking into version eight, nine, 10, 11, but if there were passes in version eight and you want version nine to be compatible with version eight, that means you are inheriting all the patches from version eight and version nine. So that's also an issue in developments of the security in software. Now we can discuss about what software development lifecycle is basically, which we all are aware and then followed by the secure development in the lifecycle of software. So software development lifecycle is basically, you know, it's an easy term, right? We all are aware of, we have been developing softwares, you know, if you are in the in, in the area of, you know, in, in computing, uh, AI computing, we are developing software uh, from like, a, you know, and we have been taught this traditional software development lifecycle methodology. That means that we need to gather in our, in our requirements, right? The first step is let's gather requirements that mean the user stories, what the user needs, stakeholders needs, and then let's design the software. Once we design, we develop the software, we code it, and then we test it and say, okay, here you go. We deploy it, and then it's we maintain it as per need by required, or this software become dead after some time. So it's a generic methodology used by most software developers, which helps us to basically lead to beneficial results. However, if you look at this whole picture, security is nowhere there, right? We have forgotten, right? We never discuss security. So if you try to talk about secure scientific development lifecycle. We're trying to mitigate the risk of software vulnerabilities with best practices and tools for securing our scientific software development. So if you look at the requirements analysis phase, we have to add risk assessment to that phase. That means we need to analyze all the risk, what can go wrong you know, in, in the first phase. Designing, we need to add threat modeling in, in the designing and development phase. Then we need to try to add static and dynamic analysis and testing and secure testing and assessment and operation assurance in the maintenance and testing phases. So you need to add extra steps to actually add security to your design of your software. So we are not basically designing software in traditional sense. We're trying to add security by design initially when you start actually trying to talk about software. This is the, one of the more uh, you know uh, recent or like commonly used or you know most commonly used lifecycle. It's called DevOps lifecycle, right? Which most of us are aware of. Here, the developer teams and IT operations team work together. That's what's called DevOps. And the collaboration is very, very nice. It leads to superior quality throughout the system. There is a continuous deployment and uh, integration of the software. There's monitoring feedback between operation and developers. And then you can talk about security in different phases if you have, if you allowed. Testing oversees the manufacture code against problems that arise after compilation. So we're basically looking into after we compile the code, we can utilize to automated tools also. Uh, after the developers check. There's a development which is continuous and there's risk assessment where developers can take advantage of running the application. However, the problem here is that security issues are only 
detected until software has passed all the tests through the security team. So we're not talking about security from the design phase or from the beginning of the life cycle. We're only doing after the fact that has been gone to all the testing teams. So what we do is we try to look into how security was is can be inbuilt in the same cycle DevOps. It's called Dev DevSecOps, right? Security in DevOps life cycle. So what we do in planning phase, right? We try to address technical security. We can investigate firewalls, antivirus solutions, password management techniques, back, you know, backups, choosing or in different security policies for production, training staff on different tools which are there, which they can use to develop, you know, during the life cycle. When you do the coding step, you are trying to basically uh, allow the, the training or the train staff to use different IDs, which comes in inbuilt security plugins. So you can actually look into vulnerabilities, right? You can inst install different plugins to investigate hidden weaknesses. You can use open web application security project OVAS, or you can use payment conduct data center, center PCI, DSS, or you can use a CVE or common and exposure database to look into different vulnerabilities, which can be exposed in your code and try to basically make sure before you encode, you are aware of the vulnerabilities and you do not have any kind of vulnerabilities in your code. Then you build your code and then use static analysis tools, which basically will help you to, you know, scan your source code, binary code for some kind of underlying security flaws. Then you can use dynamic code to, when you run your application to basically analyze the front end vulnerabilities. During testing phase, you can look into chaos testing, which will help you to perform health checks. You can also look into the first testing, which will help you to basically test your application various invalid or you know, random inputs to the uh, to your system. In release phase, you can look into continuous code signing, which makes sure that you know you are implementing corporate security policies at least to software development. Then deployment phase, you want to make sure that there is signature verification. So we can actually verify the integrity of the application signature to ensure the application is coming from a valid resource. Then on operation, you can use RAS, which is a secure technology that uses runtime instrumentation, uh, instrumentation to detect and block computer attacks, utilizing the information from inside the running the software. Then lastly, monitoring phase, which we, is very important is uh, you can use the entity and behavior analytics like OBA is the type of security solution that discovers threats by identifying activity that differs from the baseline behavior. So in this way, you can add security in each and every step of your life cycle, not just at the end when everything is done. Uh, before I move on, I'll take some questions if anybody is have any questions at this stage before I move on to the threat modeling. That's the, you see the text. Uh, Nin, I'm not seeing any questions at this point. Okay, that's good. Okay, I'll, I'll move on then. Thanks, Eric. Um, so now we're going to talk about how do we design security in our software development lifecycle, right? So designing, that's the threat modeling and very important phase and often overlooked. So designing for security, which is now everybody is crying for because you are done basically patching up the software, you know, after the fact you get a hacked, right? So the goal of threat modeling is the following. We, it enables organizations to anticipate threats rather than react. So you're looking to proactive approach. That it will also help you to prioritize resources, allowing the organization to look for what are the most important vulnerabilities you need to tackle first. It also helps you to promote development of secure software and also to try to reduce the risk and force the cost of cyber incident because you know we all think we are secure because we have outsourced our cybersecurity to XYZ third-party vendor. But you have to also acknowledge the fact that the third party vendor gets hacked. You are also getting hacked along with the third party and you do not know anything about how third party is interacting with your security. So what is threat modeling? Threat modeling is basically assessing risk, a security risk of a software from adversaries point of view. So we are looking from your software, not from a developer point of view. You have to get the mentality out because from your point of view, everything will look nice. You have fulfilled the requirements of the client. You have been doing the perfect work. It, it's, it's working as it is. But now you have to look from a malicious point of view. See, what can you attack? What can go wrong? What can you use? What are the back, you know, back doors which I can use to basically destroy your software? The risk here is defined as the potential for loss, damage, or destruction of an asset as a result of a threat exploiting a vulnerability. So what exactly we do in threat modeling? It's a proactive approach for identifying, managing, and mitigating potential threats. So we're trying to identify, manage, and trying to mitigate. So we do the three-step approach 
we're trying to define all the system components, right? What are the different assets of your, you know, uh, software? What are the entry points? How the data will flow go in? How data will come out? You recognize potential threats to the data entry points. Then you to categorize the threats into different categories and implement the countermeasure. How do you counteract with those particular threats? The goal here is to improve system security and minimize the security risk. The components of a threat model will be the six components are first system overview, where, which means that you need to understand how the system and software function. So you need to elaborate on the interaction of your software. How, what are the, who are the use case actors? You know, who are interacting with your software? Is it just an admin, a user, a new user, old user? Who can interact, right? Stakeholders and how can they interact? Then you look into the assets, the information that needs to be protected. For example, what's important for your system? Is the data is what I can steal? I can steal the configuration. I can see intellectual property. What can I steal if I'm a malicious person from your software? Why is it important to me? If it's not, then you're safe. But normally something is there in your system or a software which can be used by the potential hacker to do something malicious. Adversaries, who might be interested? Once you know your assets, you know, okay, who, suppose my asset is data, right? Or intellectual property. Who can be interested in my in compromising my system? They can do for fun, like I mentioned. They can also do for political motivation. They can also do because they want to destroy your reputation. Then attack vectors. How many adversaries might attack the system? How can they attack? So you look and list the attack vectors, then look into weakness and vulnerabilities, points with adversaries could exploit. So you look into, for example, right, my garage door is, there's a hole in the garage door, right? It's a vulnerability, it's a weakness, can be exploited by the malicious people or by rats, right, to come into my house. So you have to, even though it's a small patch, you have to do it, it's still a patch, right? Still somebody can see it's a patch and destroy it. You can't change the garage door, but still you can do something which is more concrete than just you know, putting a duct tape over that, right? Just to give an example. Then mitigation, what measures can be taken to lessen the risk of vulnerability? So we do the six components of the threat modeling. So how do we process uh, uh, the steps which we take in threat modeling will be these. So you decompose your system into assets, users, entry points, and data flows. So what are the main assets, main functionality? So overall functions of your system, what all my system does. Then who are the users or the actors of my systems? What are the entry points to my portal, to my portal or to my software and how the data flows between these different assets or different functions of my software? Once you know your total system, which is basically in design phase, you will identify threats. You will identify potential threats from all the perspectives, malicious developer, and then try to analyze the weaknesses that could be exploited by the malicious folks. Then once you know the weaknesses, you try to estimate the impact and likelihood, what can happen? Because not every threat will have you know, likelihood of 100% right, happening. It might be 1%. You need to concentrate on the most important threat and then try to strategize to look into the countermeasures which you can develop to reduce the risk. Then you document, communicate, you keep, keep recording all the findings, action, and unresolved risk. And as the software develops in different iterations, you keep updating the model as software development, also as the threat involves. Because if the version one is coming 2023, that might have different threats and, uh, as opposed to version which comes 2024. So as threat evolves, your model will also evolve. So I'm now going to discuss the one of the most mature uh, threat model uh, strategy or methodology is called Stride. Stride methodology uh, it was developed by Microsoft. It's used to identify and categorize potential threats. Typically, it's used to do the design phase of a system, and it covers mainly the technical aspects, not the physical aspect of a system. So here, Stride is an you know abbreviation for S stands here for spoofing identity, T stands for tampering with data, R stands for repudiation, I stands for information disclosure, D stands for denial of service, and E stands for elevation and privilege. These are the stride categories in which we try to categorize our threats. So the first is spoofing identity, right? Here, what is spoofing? An attack can impersonate another user. For example, right, I if I work for a DOE lab, I can basically impersonate as an admin and try to take over the identity of somebody like my my manager, right? And, or send a spoof email, right? Like saying, okay, you know, I'm, it's, you will believe it's coming from a manager. It's not from a manager, it's from me. So here I'm trying to spoof identity, IP, ARP, DNS, 
And then damage, which can be caused, will be unauthorized access. Somebody can steal the data or damage the reputation. For example, it's coming from, you know, I said department head, right, of your department. And, and he or she does not know. And it comes from them. Everybody clicks on the link and here you go, you know, it's stolen. The data is stolen or your, your passwords are compromised. Mitigation is two-factor authentication, encryption, education. Education is now very important. You need to educate and train, not just training, right? Like people like, okay, do this type of training, but you need to actually, you know, do some kind of real life threats. That means that like we do fire drills, you need to have cyber drills also in your organization. So people are aware of spams or how do you act with the spams? Tampering with data. So that's T stands for, you know, in stride. Here, that means unauthorized alt alteration of data where we can tamper the data, the code, the configuration. Here, the damage which can be caused is we can, again, do the unauthorized access. Somebody can have false information plugged in and the lack of data integrity. Here, uh, for example, you know, I open up a database, I change the log files. That's basically tampering, right? That means nobody knows that I entered or somebody came to your office or was checked in, you know, or, or was there, somebody steal something from your office. Nobody knows, right? Somebody runs a job on your or system and nobody knows there's no log of system. Somebody tampers with your job scheduler. Nobody knows, right? So it's basically tampering with data. The hard to it again, checks for data integrity, secure transmission protocol and restriction aspects. That means that you try to implement different principal ex, principal release privilege that, that for example, I have a privilege of an affiliate, I cannot do any work which basically was allowed, right? Even though, you know, I can allow, be allowed to do some of the functions, but no, they will say no. And it takes multiple steps to get this approved, not just one step. Repudiation means that where user denies having performed an action. And I said that I did not, you know, uh, order something on amazon.com. A transaction can be repudiation, email, a contract repudiation. For example, there's a, you know, document we send through, you know, Google, right? Say, well, I sent a document, I never got it. This can damage the reputation for businesses. This can cause auditing problems. It can also enforce inability for accountability. So what we do is normally we try to have digital signatures, which became more and more common during COVID times. Now we do everything digitally. They are authentication protocols and monitoring. Monitoring is very important again, because even though you have digital signatures, somebody can still spoof your signatures, right? Uh, so make sure it's coming from verified resource. Now, in Stride, D stands for denial of service, where basically uh, you are trying to make a system unavailable to users, which we are well aware of DDoS attacks. Here, uh, a network application system level can be attacked where it's not, it becomes unavailable to the legit users. For example, if I'm trying to log in into a DOE website and it's got, you know, basically uh, there's a denial of service attack on, the, on this website, nobody can log into it because and right now it's catering to all the bots who are basically trying to occupy all the services from this website. Damage can be financial damage and loss of trust because for example, Amazon gets, you know, denial of service tag. That means it's, if it's down for one hour, it loses, you know, millions of dollars in one hour. Loss of trust, nobody will basically try to log into your website because, you know, there's some da damages there. So what we try to do is we try to have a uh, countermeasure of firewalls, capacity planning, and traffic filtering. Try to filter the, the traffic. You try to have heartbeat. That means after some time, suppose three or four attempts, you just lose the connection from the bots, right? And capacity, that means after like 10,000 of requests from XYZ or 2,000, you just cut the connection. Elevation of privilege uh, is uh, the last, yeah, which is the E of stride. Here, a user is trying to gain higher access privilege than intended. So this is very important when it comes to, especially when you have different clearance levels, uh, which types of the elevation privilege, which can happen is role access or privilege escalation. Here, damage can be system manipulation. Somebody can manipulate system. They can be damaged to the system. They can have unauthorized access to sensitive data, which is not required or should not be given. The mitigation will be access to controls, patch management, regular auditing, and principal lease privilege, which is basically, you know, uh, can be used. Uh, you, you have we have different models called Bella Padula models or you know Viva model, which can be implemented from scratch when you design the model to have these principles implemented. Then you have limitations, right? Which they are all those limitations on everything, right? It's, it's most mature, but again, the limitation of stride will be no built-in method for risk scoring. You cannot quantify the risk. It's yes, qualitatively, you can have different categories. You can, it focuses mainly on technical threats, which leads out physical security threats, which are again important when talking about cyber physical threats. And it relies heavily on the DFD, the data, how data flows through the system. 
that means that you are looking into some person who actually have really high level expertise of the overall system. That means you want to embed this from the design of the uh, software. Next is red methodology. Again, a different modern technology uh, methodology, again, introduced by Microsoft. It's basically used to evaluate and assess the risk of threats. So here it's used basically with other methods like stride. Stride and dread are used together because it aims to prioritize resources, address the most significant threats, but it helps you to give you a scoring system. So again, DRED, uh, D R E A D, stands for damage potential, reproducibility, exploitability, effective users, and discoverability. Again, damage potential means how bad an attack is. That means the potential of uh, you know damage can be data loss, service interruption, financial damage, and reputation damage. Consequences, again, depend upon severity, right? How bad attack was. Mitigation, you keep you know, regular backups, incident response planning, disaster recovery planning. Again, you know, if you think that, okay, my services can do go down, for example, you know, your uh, monitoring service can go down, how bad it can go? You know, if it goes down for two hours, three hours, what can I lose, right? What is the, do you have a contingency plan in place? Suppose nobody's at, uh, you know, in, the, in the center, and as only one person operations team is there, can everybody, can that one person handle this type of damage? No, or yes. Reproducibility, right? How easy is attack is reproduced, right? That means you can uh, exploit scripts, automate the attacks and manual attacks. High reproducibility means results means that you are basically trying to do more frequent damage because you can reproduce the attacks. Now, again, patching the vulnerabilities and implementing IDS systems is very important for uh, tackling these kind of threats. Exploitability is what is needed to launch attack. So no user interaction to extensive user interactions. So basically, again, uh, you know, it's easier if uh, it is to exploit and attack than higher the risk of its one occurring, right? Because I know if I can exploit this that easily, that means that people can exploit. Once you know that there's a patch or there's a vulnerability system, it basically, you know, is is broadcast on the internet, and everybody, you know, all the malicious people can actually exploit the same vulnerability in your system. Mitigation: as soon as there's attack, you try to educate to the secure programming from the beginning, and try to have reg regular vulnerability scanning of your software. Affected users, right? How many users can be affected? Single user, group of users, all users. So, for example, you know, if there's attack on a big uh, supercomputing facility. Who all are attacked, right? Who are affected? The more user affected, the more damage going to occur because the users might be some users which are basically users from which who has high clearance level. So what you do is you have to have a mid principle of least privilege implemented, like different model that even though it's attacked, but nobody can you know get into the different levels even though you get access to the network. Segmentation of network and different access controls have to be implemented. Discoverability is the last you know, in red, which means how easy the, the threat is to discover. Threats that are easy to discover to threats that are extremely difficult to discover. Consequences will be the more likely a threat is to be discovered, the more likely it's to be exploited, right? That's pretty common. What we do, we need to know is that we have to test our system continuously with different first testing or regular pen testing and regularly scanning for vulnerabilities. Like our system evolved, we need to have different audits done and also reported, not just for us. Now, how do we take uh, stride and thread basically, you know, uh, work together? Then uh, can I ask you to yes, yes. pause and address right. questions in the, the Q and A doc? Um, the first question is: Can you comment on the impacts to users of Science DMZ? I'm not personally familiar with that, but maybe you are. Well, the thing is, uh, if uh, I have an example at the end where I have a portal example where basically I'm doing the collaboration, I will say if you are uh, the 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 impact would be basically tamping the data, right? If you are dealing with science DMZ, if somebody is trying to use a wrong data which is given by you, their results might self uh, which were published or suppose you know I use a data set from science DMZ and I publish my results on it. So people keep building on the results. That means that or we can say loss of scientific fidelity is one of the most important consequence of attack on science DMZ. Thanks, Ed. Uh, the next question is, um, I experienced personal financial damage from someone spoofing an AWS admin first via email. I failed to inspect the email headers in my panic. Then by my dialing an included spoof toll-free number, requesting reimbursable funds in the form of gift cards to help trace hypothetical server security leaks. How can that be addressed using Stride? 
So like I mentioned in Stryer, right? Like, first of all, if, if you look at the, uh, you know, spoofing, the first one, education is very important. Like I said, like when you were doing it, because it happens to me, trust me, last night, if somebody was trying to uh, hack into my house system, my kids were watching TV and they, they were told to give remote control of the TV to someone. I don't know how it happened. So it happens. My, my kids know, even though they're like seven and 10 years old, that how do, how do you react? Because they, 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 they see me like always screaming at them. But uh, what you do need to do is education, I think, uh, like live, you know, replicas of the spams. So now few the industry companies are making mandates. For example, if you do three, if you click on three spoof emails, you're fired, basically. So they are not allowing more than three chances. So, for example, randomly, somebody will send you a spoof email. And once it's fine, right, you click on the link, you know, you get training. Second, warning. Third, a letter to go. So it's not like you should implement the same. It's not a good, you know, methodology. But yes, the education is important, uh, and that comes with, you know, because they, in everybody feeds on the spoofing and the fear and panic which you had. You know, it happened uh, to me. I always say that uh, make sure you have a trail of, you know, um, uh, you know, emails or whatever it's coming from, so you actually can filter it out. You know, for next version, one is fine. But again, you know, nobody can. You know, like I said, we always learn. And then, sorry, the, the last question, I think you will uh, address some of this later on in your, your presentation, but um, maybe you can say just a few sentences here. It okay. says, this presentation seems to be primarily targeted at maintainers of systems, and it contains great advice on that topic. However, how does that filter down to, say, a graduate student with minimal experience, time, and funding who just needs to run some code for their work? Yeah, I have it. Uh, so the thing is, I start with a simple example in next in like next uh, two three slides, and then I go to the more complicated example. So I had it both because you know I teach uh, uh, this class also and security, and I know how it's gonna go. So I had it for both audiences: people who are basically with no expertise and people who are basically expert in systems. Okay, sounds perfect. Then right. thank you. Thank Listen. you. Thanks, Eric. All right, so let's talk about how do we talk, you know, deal with both. So Stride here helps us to identify and categorize the risk into all STRID categories. And basically, and, you know, we try to do DFD diagrams and the dread, you know, here assess the risk and gives them a score. So basically, you know, Stride was more, you know, into, into systems. Now we have quantitative and qualitative both together. Once we get that, we prioritize the threats based on the score. And then we try to, mitigate, you know, have the mitigation strategies basically to, you know, uh, deal with the with the threat, which is the highest dread score. Then we try to apply the strategies and try again, keep reassessing because it's a, it's a loop, right? You do keep going till you basically meet the organization standards, which are really important because organization these days are trying to develop more standards, right? Not because of given scenario, but still they are lacking. Then you develop a document all strategies and chances because you need to make sure that whoever comes after you, if you're a consultant, they should know what was implemented and how and what was changed. And you keep performing this risk assessment regularly. So now let's start with, you know, how do we use Stripe? So like the first thing which we have to say is we have to understand it from an adversary's view, right? And look for, look, now open up your, you know, basically malicious eyes and see what is valuable, right? Characterize your system security using use cases and misuse cases. Use cases are the functional, that means my system what function my system performs. Misuses cases, which nobody actually talks about is basically what can my system do, which I don't want it to do, or what can be used by the malicious person are the misuse cases. Once you know those, you try to create the data flow diagram. Uh, what happened? Can you see my slide? Data flow diagram. And then you identify threats using stride categories. Then you try to determine risk level and develop mitigation strategies. Then you document all the threats, risk, and mitigation strategies together. So here's the example. We start with a simple, plain example of a car optimizer. So some or few of us are into cars, right? I love cars, so I put up this example with one of my students did it, uh, the project on this, to this car optimizer, which basically is a software system, uh, which is used for, it's, it's a hypothetical system, right? For Just for using the example for Stride. For individual who wants to optimize their car's uh, performance, software will feature numerous makes and models of vehicles for the use to choose from covering all the main manufacturers. After they shows their car, they will be able to view its performance from the factory. In addition to the car's factory performance, they will be able to choose different parts for the car and see how their car will perform with performance enhancement installed. 
not only will the user be able to see the performance of their vehicle with these new parts installed, but also they will be able to see the cost and a guide on installation. User will be able to configure different vehicle specification and see how they will affect the performance compared to the, how the car comes from the factory. So we're trying to optimize the car. So here there's a few of the use cases, the functional requirement, right? What requirements are the user stories which are given to us by the stakeholders or to develop a software. So first will be login, you know, we need to have a login, we need to have, we can view part, then we can do make car configuration, we can manage database, we can view gallery of different uh, configurations, we can access user profiles, access some logs, log actions, manage user controls. So all of these functionality, these are the use cases, what I want as a user or as a stakeholder in my particular software. Next is, if you look at this as a use case diagram, here it basically depicts on the left and the bottom side who all of the actors of my software. That means who basically are interacting. For example, there's a professional user, customer support, manufacturers, right? Affiliates, inventory managers, moderators, a time, right? So what's missing? We are missing again, the security requirements. There's nothing about security in this whole. This is the traditional software life lifecycle. We, we get the requirements from the, use, from the user or stakeholders, and we try to develop our use cases and try to start designing our software. What if I add, misuse cases, that means we try to address security attacks, that what can go wrong now? Somebody can tamper database, right? That means hackers may try to tamper the database or system logs to manipulate them. Mediation, where we have to also not only have to misuse cases, but we also have the mitigation cases where we have to check access control to ensure that unauthorized access cannot be gained. We will implement two-factor authentication to further prevent this. Unauthorized login, we're trying to attempt gain. They are not authorized to have. Again, we try to mitigate by checking credentials, limiting multiple login attempts, two-factor authentication. If you are trying to modify input data, we try to, uh, you know, attack will be attempted to input the faulty or malicious data into database to the front end. What we do is you try to sanitize and validate user input. Next, if you try to steal user information, that means attacker might try to attempt to view user database tables to gain access sensitive information. What we need to do is we need to have access control mechanisms encryption for this data to be implemented. Then lastly, is, for example, is access system logs with attackers trying to access the manipulate system logs. You, again, you need to implement access controls and two-factor authentication. So what we do is we try to add use cases is already there. If you look here, I added a misuse cases and an actor, which is basically our malicious user, which can do these use cases. So these are the use cases in red are the use cases which adversary will do tampering, accessing, attempting, right? And then on the right side of the mitigation, security cases, which will be implemented along with the use cases. So traditionally, only use cases were implemented, misuse cases and security cases were not. Now, if you want to design for security, you know, make sure these are also implemented as a functionality in your data, in, in your software. Once you're done with this, you try to create a DFD diagram, uh, which is data flow, which will help you to determine different external entities interacting with your software, who can be also malicious user. And you can see how, which are the entry points and exit points of a system. What is going in, what's coming out. So once you do this whole context diagram of a car optimizer, you can basically dig down into the level zero, which basically give you a more enhanced view of your uh, software. And then if you look at the dotted lines here, these dotted lines basically talks about that, you know, here is the, the entry point of data, which can be used by the malicious person for attempting unauthorized login, right? So you can basically have hijack session, tamping. So if you dig, keep digging down into your DFD, you can look into the, how data is flowing and how the data flow can be tampered or hijacked or basically used by you know, malicious user to access to your system. So it's it looks very tedious. Yes, it's a, like I said, it's, it's, it's requires some knowledge, but again, there's the Microsoft Thread modeling tool, which can also help you to basically, you know, uh, develop uh, DFD. Here, it's very easy. You can, you know, you can have your different functions and then each of this uh, lines depict a entry point or exit point where you can actually add what kind of threat it is, you know, what can go wrong with this entry exit point and what you have to do to mitigate those particular threats. And then here is a boundary, which is basically how the different attack services can be attacked by using malicious person. Now, this is the example of the, the you know, one of the entry point. If I basically, I'm using the tool, I can say, you know, uh, the, the potential process crash or stop for review content is my, one of the threat, which has priority high. 
Category will be denial of services, description I add to it, review content crashes, halt stops, run slowly in all cases, building availability metric, just that they can be to do thorough code review, debugging of you know, the mechanisms. Now this you can implement, and when, by the time you implement all these threats in the threat modeling tool, you will have basically three to 400 page report, which will list all the threats, all the mitigation you have in place for these threats. Now, next example I have is for more, you know, uh, HPC users. So post-era.ai is a platform designed for collaborative development of therapeutic uh, compounds against COVID-19. It allows the research and scientists to contribute the compounds by submitting molecular structure. The site facilitates the collection, analysis, and prioritization of these compounds for synthesis, simulation, and testing, providing a unique collaborative approach to accelerate COVID-19 drug survey. So this is a, a typical example of how, you know, being in HPC we use, we actually use the data from different sites. We actually try to collaborate. We use different portals for collaboration. We document in different, different, you know, collaborative, you know, uh, platforms. And then we are also trying to submit our jobs to uh, uh, HPC cluster, depending upon the data we have, and try to, you know, publish our findings, right, and have discussion feedback. So here's the use case diagram, right, of our, uh, you know, our post era.ai. If you look at, if you have users, I've just made it simple, so, that, you know, very, very convenient. So if you look at the, this side, right, these are the use cases, right? So what basically we need from this, what we have in this portal, that means that we can submit the compound as a user, we can draw the design, we can collaboratively you know, review the design, we can change the parameters, we can submit a simulation to a cluster, we can terminate the simulation, we can log in, we can you know, basically try to create a post, comment on a post, we can participate in discussion, we can like a post, delete a post like we do, we can track our submissions, we can see what compounds were submitted, we can search for different compounds in the system, we can check availability. So that, that's all you know, the functionality of our portal. Now, this is what basically a malicious user can do, right? So tampering, right? We can basically tamper the simulation. We can cause the data to be manipulated, right? For example, there is a compound. I can change the compound and submit there, right? I can log in as a, a famous scientist and change the compound. How do you know it's not coming from me? It's in the database. I can tamper it. I can easily disclose the information which is not meant to be disclosed. I can use the supercomputer time for doing blockchain simulation. So if you look at the uh, the one attack which happened 2021 was uh, most of the supercomputers in Europe were hacked to do the blockchain cryptocurrencies simulations and they are still shut down because nobody could figure out how people got access to these clusters. Again, you can have different, you can spoof, you can do phishing, denial of service. So these are the attacks. And what you do is you try to have a mitigation strategies for these attacks where you have to have system logs, encryption, MFA, I don't discuss about these. So once you know what can go wrong, what you need to implement to avoid these you know, uh, threats, you basically try to come up with a DFD, right? DFD is simple, you know, context diagram, like what post data can do. You can have different compounds data submitted to supercomputers for cluster. You can have a user which can do the forum response, you know, submit the compounds or post a, you know, a result. There's discussion board, there's a feedback from admin. Simple, basic examples. Now this is the more detailed view, right? So of, of DFD, suppose I have compound submissions, we have feedback, we have forum interaction simulation. For example, if I look at the right side, right? On supercomputing cluster simulation, right? If you look at these different, uh, so if uh, 3.0 is COVID-19 simulation, I'm trying to simulate uh, the compounds on the cluster. So it can, what can go wrong? Third data theft, right? Job data disclosure can be done. Tamping data, somebody can manipulate the files and loss of fidelity can happen. Another service, somebody can saturate the network. Spoofing, somebody can basically tamper with the scheduler configuration. That means if you are supposed to have the best queue, you get the last queue, which is lowest queue, and you will never get a chance to basically submit your compound. In discussion board manager on the left, you can basically have different type of tasks like tampering. Somebody can modify your content. Like, you know, how do you know that? Suppose, you know, I have, I'm used working on a Google right, account, and we all are sharing a result, supposed to model the proposal view, and somebody basically copy and paste or delete my paragraph. Who knows? Are you checking the logs? There should be a more logging technique. There should be a, a exposure there. There should be a add an entity, you know, forgery or some kind of mechanism which will help you to give you feedback. So there are multiple of these spoofing, tampering, reputation, which can happen in all of these levels. So this is what is required when you do the designing of the stride in your model. 
Now, lastly, we're going to talk about, I have only like five more minutes before I take questions, is SAS and DAS tools. Static analysis tools are basically used to for Kotlinness and finding COD vulnerabilities. You have different tools like, you know, if you're using Java, you have PMD or spot bugs. TPP check helps you to do for different type of checks in C++ code. You can do dynamic analysis using OVAP, uh, you know, SAP tool or pen testing, which combines both static and dynamic analysis. So what's static analysis? We are trying to basically test our computer program without examining the code, without executing it. Uh, we're trying to uh, address weaknesses in source code that could lead to a different vulnerability, like in buffer overflow, a common sort of vulnerability, right? We're trying to address, uh, find various type of checks, right? Against different vulnerabilities, like automated variable checking, bound checking, class checking, memory leaks, resource leak, dead code elimination, performance errors, and undefined variables. Dynamic analysis, which is the pen test thing, is basically we're trying to pretend like an adversary. You try to break in, you're trying to basically run the code, execute the code, and you know, try to test it on uh, your, your system on pre-created set of tools. For example, Kaggle Linux is, is a distribution based on Debian. It's pre-installed with 600 pen testing programs, including Nmap, a port scanner, Wireshark, which basically scans the packets, and OVASAP, which is basically the open web application source uh, vulnerability, which will help you to find the vulnerabilities in your applications. You can use pen testing you know, before the release of your software. Five phases in pen testing will be reconnaissance, which we are trying to discover domain names. Basically, they're trying to gather intelligence on your system. For example, I'm trying to hack into your application. I can actively use reconnaissance to using the network or passively by not touching the network. I can scan the ports for the IP, which I have figured out, which can have some kind of vulnerabilities and then try to sniff it around the ports which can be open like samba port can be open and try to gather data about your application then once i know scan like this is the application server i need to hack into i need to gain the access from system point of view to get control access and then once i have the access i will maintain a backdoor to maintain an access once i have done you know patching up because i you know you will be working ethical you know uh, uh, pen tester, so you will be basically patching up your application because you are acting as a hacker, not as a hacker. So you will, when you patch up everything, all the vulnerabilities in your system software, you have to also cover tracks when you get out. You need to escape the security, you need to clear everything, so nobody can know what kind of attacks or what kind of vulnerabilities existed in your system. To conclude, uh, a secure software development enables organization to anticipate threats rather than reacting to them as a proactive approach uh, it helps you to prioritize the resources, allowing for an organization to focus on most significant vulnerabilities first. It helps you to promote the development of secure software and also help to, to reduce the risk and cost of cybersecurity incident. Uh, here's a blog. If uh, it, The slides will be posted, uh, I think, on the portal. And the blog has linked to, I think, six slide decks, which has more than 200, 300 slides on different topics of uh, software development of the four cycles of different uh, static analysis tools, dynamic analysis tools. If like, you know, there's a question about grad student, right? If you are looking into different tools, what you need to implement and use, they're all there. Uh, you can use all the resources to develop, you know, what kind of application you're looking into. So it starts with the introduction of secure software, then you have security, then you threat modeling, different threat modeling, then there are some kind of uh, the real use cases of threat model techniques followed by the static analysis tools and then the tools which you can be used in your securing the software. Thank you. With that, I'll take questions now. I'll have, I think, seven to eight minutes. Yeah, no problem. Uh, thank you very much, Newton. Uh, thank you for a very comprehensive introduction to uh, the security perspective on secure software development. Um, there's a question in the Q of A. It's probably a good place to start. It says, uh, do you or do you plan to collaborate with those in trustedci.org? Yeah, sure. I think uh, uh, so. Uh, Trust.ci.org is already like you know they do the workshops you know all over the place. I, I uh, you know I actually go to workshops and listen to different you know tutorials in which they are offered. Uh, yes, for sure. Yeah, that's that's basically a really good way to go. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, another question is um, Alfred. Do you, do you want to unmute and ask your question or? I, I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, Alfred asks, Stride and Dread are developed by Microsoft. Do they work on Linux? If not, what are some alternatives for Linux? Yeah, they work on every different so thing. Is They are methodologies, right? They're not specific on to a software or to a software, you know, portal, anything. 
if you look their categories, you know, which can be basically any, uh, it can be implemented on any kind of, you know, OS or whatever you're working on. So it's not specific. It's, yeah, it's made by Microsoft, but it's not specific to a platform or to a, a software. Thank you. Um, so that's all the questions in the Q&A doc. I, I'd like to open the floor for anybody else who want, wants to unmute and, and ask their question directly to Nitin. Can I, this is my career. Can I just ask a question? Is that okay? Yes, sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for a very nice talk. Um, I, so a lot of us work on things like, uh, you know, uh, scientific libraries and tools and, you know, that are used in specialized situations and platforms. And a lot of the, the vulnerabilities and threats that you mentioned it may not be as relevant as others. And, and I'm just curious if you've seen or have content that addresses, you know, very specific software situations, uh, as I'm describing. For example, let's say you're developing a scientific library. It gets embedded in an application. And, and so it's, you know, direct vulnerabilities. There's not a, you know, a chance for, um, you know, uh, any kind of uh, you know, SQL insertion or, you know, th that kind of thing. You know, a lot of the software as a service type stuff, at least it seems to me that our vulnerabilities are more specific and more uh, isolated. And, and often I think it's, you know, just if we do a good job of writing correct code where we don't, for example, you know, overwrite memory or you know, do anything that's unintentional that we're doing an okay job at least. What are your thoughts? Correct. The thing is, so when we try to, like you mentioned, right, when you try to have the use case of your scientific library, right, which is to be embedded in a, in a different program or something, yes, you might have a security by obscurity because it's basically secretly you know, hidden in the software. But again, that's also some kind of time it's, it's basically, uh, you know, attracts the malicious people to think about what's hidden, right? So you, sometimes you cannot achieve it. So if you try to look into what data is flowing, how the the your library is interacting with the main API or with the main software, that's the only entry point. If you cut down that entry point or secure that entry point, then you are secure. So if you are designing it from already from that point of view, from the beginning, that's the goal, right? That's That's the best way to do it. But if we have never thought about it, you just think that yes, you know, we will have no none of these vulnerabilities because we are embedded inside a software. That's a wrong opinion. I will say that you know, for example, if you go on uh, here, uh, example, right? If I'm trying to put you know a user and trying to uh, you know uh, talk to the post era, and then I have a review feedback inside the post era, right? I'll say nobody can interact. But if I know these dotted line if you see the you know these three entry and exit points and if you basically secure these three entry and exit point for all the misuse cases which you can think of from adversity point of view you are secure but sometimes in rush because we try to implement you know on in pressure because you all know how it how we work in scientific world because it's not industry you know we are just doing to publish papers most of us uh we not we avoid this checkings we are saying okay we have this it's working you know, I've seen many of the, um, you know, I will not say the names, but people trying to, you know, collaborate and, you know, say, okay, I have this scheduler, I have this, let's work together, right? Yes, but, you know, once I have this big software, it can be hacked too. It can be used as a hack to your university or to your lab. So might be it is right now secure, but might be there's something open there in the mainframe or main software, which is using your library which can be used. And then once that software is ha hacked, your library, which is supposed to be proprietary or you know, classified, nobody should know that, that's also exposed along with the main software. So like I said, when you outsource the, the software or the, if you're thinking that it's outsourced, it's it's main software problem, but that's basically, if you're giving somebody your code, it's actually your problem too, to see like if the code, if the people are using the code or your data are using it for in a meaningful way. 
that's okay. the, I'm gonna have to stop you there. Thank you. Um, yeah, let me thank you one more time for for giving your thank presentation. You all. We enjoyed it very much, and uh, that will conclude the seminar today. So thank you everyone for for joining for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you all.